Welcome to the latest Lowy Institute Long Distance event. I'm Natasha Kassam, Director of the Institute's Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program. I'm speaking from the Lowy Institute in Sydney. I acknowledge the traditional owners of country where I am today, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, as well as the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and pay my respect to Elders past and present. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Audrey Tang today, Taiwan's Digital Minister. She wrote a computer game at age eight to help her four-year-old brother learn fractions. She dropped out of school as a teenager to start a search engine company and left Taiwan to go to Silicon Valley before she was 20. She became involved in politics during Taiwan's 2014 Sunflower Movement and is now Taiwan's government minister that is the youngest of her time and remarkably a self-described anarchist. She's become a leading figure in Taiwan's pandemic response and this week will represent Taiwan at President Biden's Summit for Democracies. Audrey Tang, welcome to the Lowy Institute. Hello, good local time everyone. As someone who has described themselves as a conservative anarchist, it is of course a bit of a surprise to see you now as a government minister. I want to ask you how today you would justify your choices to the you of before, or do you need to justify them at all? Not at all. I, I mean, I'm working with the government, but I'm not working for the government. I've never um, issued or accepted a single direct order since joining the government in 2016. Uh, so I remain kind of uh, committed to the principle of voluntary association and all the staff uh, in my team coming from all the different ministries while they join by their own volition. Well, actually, maybe we can ask about that. I mean, what, what is the role of a digital minister? You know, how did that come about? Are you the first? Is this something other countries have? Certainly. So, yes, I'm Taiwan's first digital minister, uh, but I'm a minister at large, meaning that uh, there's nine of us in the cabinet office that doesn't have a dedicated ministry. But rather, we work, as I mentioned, with secondments from all the other 32 ministries uh, on interagency issues. So, for example, my portfolio is open government, social innovation and youth engagement. And digital is kind of the way to transcend the space and time restrictions and boundaries to enable the kind of listening, mutual listening at scale that would enable like open government work. Well, then maybe you can tell us about how you came to start doing this kind of work. You know, I believe it was through the Sunflower Movement. Could, could you tell us more about that? Certainly. Uh, in 2014, March, uh, there were three weeks where we occupied the parliament completely peacefully uh, in a nonviolent way uh, and deliberated with half a million people on the street and many more online about a cross-strait service and trade agreement with Beijing, which at that time, uh, the nationalist um, party leading the parliament and the administration was trying to kind of force through uh, the parliamentary process without much deliberation. So um, there's many topics around 20 different NGOs that helped the Occupy deliberate it on each corner of the street. For example, one corner deliberated on whether uh, we allow the uh, 4G infrastructure and then a very new thing um, to have vendors uh, coming from the PRC uh, in the so-called private sector there. Now, uh, whether they're state-owned or could be state-owned at any given moment and so on was the point of deliberation and we agreed that uh, the systemic risk assessment which we'll have to do on each and every upgrade is much more expensive than if we went with some other more democratic and accountable uh, regimes um, instruments, right? Their, their private sector is, is more, more fixed uh, private sector. Uh, and so that was one of the consensus that was reached uh, on the street in a nonpartisan cross-partisan fashion. And my role is just to ensure that there is sufficient broadband access uh, in the occupied area, as well as a uh, transcript, a recording of the deliberations so that the people can cross-pollinate and starting each day deliberate based on the good enough consensus on the previous day, uh, unlike in other Occupy movements, uh, where maybe it just diverges uh, after a few weeks. So you were working to find consensus on the street and now consensus online potentially. Can you tell us a little bit mm -hmm. about your kind of ideas about open government and digital democracy and the way this is playing out in Taiwan? Yes, yeah, certainly. 
in, in Taiwan, uh, we see democracy as a kind of social technology that gets better when more people improve its bandwidth and latency, right? Uh, and these two ideas uh, are from internet uh, governance, the, indeed the internet itself. For example, uh, voting, uh, the traditional way, would be like uploading uh, three bits of information if you choose one of the eight parties, for example. Uh, and the latency is very long, right? It's every four years. And so the bits uh, that can be gathered for decisions is very low uh, when uh, we see it in terms of internet governance. So in Taiwan, we've been working on, for example, uh, e-petitions. Each and every one uh, citizen or even resident can start a petition that collects 5,000 signatures and that warrants a ministerial response. If it's interagency, I personally in my office uh, host twice a month collaboration meetings to figure out the solutions and mutual accountability with the petitioners, not just for the petitioners, but with all the stakeholders. So that's one example. And we have, of course, participatory budgeting. We have the presidential hackathon where the social innovators can bring a local idea that's uh, tried and true in a smaller region for three months or more. Uh, and uh, each time out of the 200 projects uh, every year, the president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, gives trophy to five teams committing herself uh, to implement as if they are presidential promises in the next fiscal year with all the budget and personnel and regulation requirements to enable from the telemedicine uh, to telecare uh, to teleeducation, uh, many other social innovations that only tried uh, on a smaller region uh, become a national wide policy through this high bandwidth collaboration. So I want to ask you about how these kinds of principles have been able to take hold in Taiwan. Is it because Taiwan's only been democratic for around 25 years? Does that help these ideas gain traction? Or do you think other countries could take a similar approach? I think um, before the Sunflower Movement, if you ask a random person on the street whether they think that the administration can work with the government, um, they'll probably say no, right? Uh, there was a considerable political apathy, uh, especially around young people. So not unlike right, the, the other jurisdictions as we are seeing now. So I, I'm not advising uh, the activists to occupy the parliament peacefully <clears throat> in other jurisdictions, but there needs to be a comparable common urgency where the state's limits in responding in the here and now are challenged. And when the civil society proves itself by coming up with better or at least more legitimate responses, um, the silver lining of the coronavirus, the pandemic, and the associated infodemic in the past couple of years, I believe provides just such opportunities because we've seen the uh, co-ops, charities, social entrepreneurs, and so on, gaining a lot of legitimacy around all the jurisdictions when people perceive, uh, sometimes even correctly, that a state uh, is really constrained uh, in its resources and response agility uh, in the ever mutating coronavirus situation. So I'm definitely going to ask about um, Taiwan's response to the pandemic in a moment. But before that, I wanted to ask you another question about digital democracy from the audience. Um, Heather mm -hmm. Rea, who is an advisor for digital inclusion at Telstra, she's asked how you can ensure that everyone can participate in a digital democracy and has access to the technology and the skills to contribute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. In Taiwan, broadband is a human right. Any place in Taiwan, even on the tip of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second uh, broadband that can support this kind of video conferencing uh, at just 15 euros per month. Um, with unlimited data. If you don't, uh, it's my fault, like personally, and people do write emails to me. Uh, and so uh, I believe this is the, the most fundamental strata 
uh, of course, we also ensure, for example, starting um, next year, uh, all the school children in the entire basic education uh, range uh, will have access not just to the highest speed Wi-Fi in their classrooms, but also the, the sufficient amount of tablets uh, to enable the hybrid uh, kind of classrooms. And we do this in spite of never going into a lockdown in the past uh, couple of years. And so I, I believe this is uh, a, a very strong commitment ever since I was a, uh, a teenager when I was 12. I already learned uh, that the uh, government's committed to provide first telephone services and then affordable kind of dial up services and so on to everyone in Taiwan. So uh, it's a strong commitment, just like our national health care, that we must uh, make sure that each and every one of our citizens is equal also on the digital equivalent of the public square of the public libraries and so on. So we also start in 2016 classified uh, the investment into digital public infrastructures as public infrastructure budget previously uh, is only for concrete things like things made out of concrete. Uh, but we realized that the commons, the digital commons, uh, uh, including the digital equivalent of town hall and museum and public libraries are uh, every bit as much uh, worth investing as the concrete counterparts. Okay, so this week you'll represent Taiwan at President Biden's Summit for Democracies. You wrote mm -hmm. recently, many democracies, including those in the Indo-Pacific, have been revealed as flawed or failing, either grasping mm -hmm. for authority or grasping for relevance. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to ask you, why are they grasping? Is it because of their regime type? Is it because of the relationship between the public and the institutions? What, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote that in the context of the pandemic response. So many jurisdictions, democratic ones uh, around the world are finding that there is a uh, perceived dilemma or trade off uh, between going to a more authoritarian uh, way in the name of public health uh, and protecting the common good or, um, or staying on the liberal democratic spectrum of things, uh, but becomes less relevant uh, when it comes to pandemic response and therefore perceived as less legitimate. That is a very common challenge in the past couple of years uh, in many jurisdictions. Uh, but of course, uh, your jurisdiction and mine are exceptions to this rule. Uh, and I, I think, I think we, we need to share to the world um, collaboratively uh, that when the country um, not see itself as constrained of only using the resources of global multinational corporations, or the state surveillance, uh, there are actually a lot more innovative possibilities. This comes from the social sector, from the civil society, and by empowering democracy. For example, in Taiwan, um, most of our uh, most important pandemic response information systems are not government technology, but invented by the social sector, by the volunteers, uh, including the mask rationing visualization system, the contact tracing system based on SMS-based QR code and so on. These are all the civil society inventions uh, and continue to be co-governed uh, by the people who care the most about privacy, about civil liberties and so on. So we can think beyond the false dilemma, not uh, over-concentrating power to the state yet, uh, protect the public health in a very effective way. So that was the context that I was writing. Uh, I believe it was for the Sydney dialogue that we can rebuild the mutual trust together. It's really interesting because we've seen a similar phenomenon here in Australia, where one of our most popular ways to find out about COVID statistics, where to get vaccinated, is a tool called COVID Base that was designed by three teenagers. Um, so we've, we've definitely seen similar things play out here. Now, before we get on to the pandemic, I do want to ask you, because of the week that it is, about democracy as an organizing principle for international cooperation. You know, there are many issues here where, for example, Taiwan has a lot of diplomatic partners that are not democratic. Australia works closely with countries that are not democratic or perhaps have illiberal mm -hmm. values embedded in their democracy. So I want to ask about what you think about democracy as a kind of vehicle for international cooperation and whether it also presents risks. Indeed. Well, as I told the uh, uh, Reuters, I believe last week, um, there will be more summits for 
democracy in the future. So for all the governments and peoples that are not yet democratic and feel maybe slighted that they have not been invited as a participant, my suggestion is always to double down on realizing democracy. So maybe by the next round or the round after the next, uh, that we will be sharing the same stage. So uh, I think it's a summit for democracy. It's not a summit that defines democratic entities forever. Um, and so I take the attitude of we can always share how democracy works, not just for the people, but also with the citizens. Do you think that technology has been empowering for authoritarians more so than for democracies? Is there, is there an asymmetry, I guess, between the ways in which democratic systems can use technologies compared to authoritarians? Depending on what sort of technology, right? Uh, if all you have is radio, which is designed for, I don't know, a few people speaking to millions of people, uh, but it could not let millions of people speak. So in, in that sense, the technology itself is asymmetric. I talk about the bandwidth of democracy. Uh, you can say that radio is definitely uh, empowering uh, the few people, the elites that can operate on the spectrums. Uh, and in democratic polities, of course, we evolved the ideas of the radio stations as gatekeepers, the journalistic sector to manage this very scarce and very important resource. But at the end of the day, I think it still gives authority to whomever holding the microphone of the radio stations. Um, but the internet is fundamentally peer-to-peer um, -peer, and it's fundamentally um, symmetrical in the sense of each and every receiver is also a broadcaster. And so in that configuration, they are symmetric. So in democratic polities, for example, each and every one uh, of our middle schoolers can, and some of them do, uh, raise petitions. The quarter or more of our citizens' initiatives were from people younger than 18. And when they real-time fact check our three presidential candidates at their presidential debate and forum, and their fact check actually appear on the live stream that millions watch, uh, that is pretty symmetrical, if you ask me. So uh, I think the internet holds the potential and the reality now uh, to empower the democratic society to truly be uh, co-governing uh, itself and making the state transparent to its citizens. Of course, the same technologies uh, are still making in more authoritarian regimes, their people transparent to their state. Uh, that is a fact, but I wouldn't say it's asymmetric. You talk about gatekeepers, and I think it's really interesting to hear about how Taiwan has had progress in terms of these open forums and public participation. But there is, of course, the potential downside for having such a large role for technology in people's lives. You look at the Facebook algorithm, for example, where it provokes you to convince you to stay online. And we can see because of that particular conspiracies gain even more traction because of these algorithms. So are you worried about those kinds of issues with social media and big technology? And what do you think we can do about it? Well, I, I draw a distinction uh, between assistive technology and assistive intelligence or AI uh, and the more authoritarian technologies uh, that concentrates power. Now, uh, the prime example of assistive technology, I happen to have it with me here is my eyeglass uh, and it's uh, aligned, right? It, it augments my vision, but it doesn't try to replace my eyes or push uh, advertisement to my retina. Uh, and also it's accountable in the sense if there's bias, um, I can take it down, right? I'm not addicted or glued uh, to it. It's not sticky and I can fix it myself or take it to the repair person down the street. And we don't have to pay tens of millions of dollars of license or reverse engineer it uh, with 10 years, um, you know, black box uh, algorithmic uh, model of reside and things like that. So um, basically, um, pretty much all the technologies that we deploy uh, our civic technologies, especially during the pandemic, when people are wary of new technology that didn't exist before the pandemic. So we start with things that people already trusted 
for decades or more, right? SMS, QR code, the national healthcare system, and things like that. So I, I would argue that uh, the intelligence is in the collective and connective crowd, uh, the, the people, not in any particular one algorithm or individual that can kind of pretend uh, to arrange for the maximal common good uh, as in the kind of algorithm that you just mentioned. I think alignment and accountability are the fundamental pillars uh, that we need to take technology and bring it to the democratic side, not to ask our democratic citizen to adapt themselves or addict themselves to the more authoritarian use of technologies. I think we've danced around it a little bit, but we've started really to hear more about your portfolio because of Taiwan's approach to handling the pandemic and the many mm -hmm. successes that Taiwan has had in handling the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about your portfolio with regard to the pandemic and how digital innovation has really helped Taiwan in this regard? Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll be brief and just uh, bring two examples. Um, the first example is the digital civic infrastructure of PTT. It's a Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, I guess, but it's um, completely free of advertisement uh, because it's in the Taiwan academic network uh, governed by the academic norms of free speech and free assembly for the past 25 years. Now, in PTT, um, there's uh, many people working on triaging the emergent ideas and uh, some threats uh, to our public. For example, uh, in December 2019, when Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan that there were seven SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market, I'm sure that it also spread to other social media networks. But uh, factually, only on PTT did people spend 24 hours to triage that information resulting in the very next day, on the first day of 2020, Taiwan started health inspection for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. And that we started our Central Epidemic Command Center, uh, complete with the daily 2 p.m. press conferences, even before we had our first local confirmed case, right? So way ahead of pretty much all the WHO members. So uh, I think the point here I want to make is that if the um, more profit seeking instead of purpose seeking uh, social media, uh, which gravitates to a more anti social corners of social media that you alluded to, right, around polarization, around hate and discrimination, and so on, uh, then the same information coming from Wuhan may evolve into something that, um, you know, uh, is just attacking. <laughs> Right, each other, right, or, or uh, trying to find conspiracy theories, as you alluded to, or things like that, but will definitely not lead uh, to the kind of early response of our pandemic um, countering measures. So that's uh, my first example. The second example uh, relates uh, to contact tracing. So last year, already a group of people called Gov0, G0V, that look at all the digital service in Taiwan uh, government, something that GOV, that TW, and brings out forks, that's the alternatives of those services, something that G0V, that TW. So just changing an O to a zero on your browser bar and you get into the kind of shadow government, uh, which works in a cooperative and collaborative fashion. Uh, the same bunch of people uh, who successfully designed the mask rationing visibility maps, more than 100 of those different maps, chatbots and voice assistant enable people to not panic and always uh, queue uh, effectively uh, in the pharmacies to receive the rationed mask back, back when, when mask was a scarcity. This year, the same bunch of people designed this system where people do not have to install any app and do not have to concentrate uh, any of their data on any multinational corporation or the state, uh, but rather kind of post a post-it note in their telecom SMS uh, inbox. So they just scan a QR code using their built-in phone and sends a toll-free SMS to 1922, uh, but uh, the five telecom carriers stores those uh, venue codes that's part of this SMS, which you just scan and type 
um, nothing and just sent. So it's like two seconds. They store these check ins, a quarter billions of which uh, are sent since this May um, in each and every telecom operator. And they do not hand over to the contact tracer unless there is actually a confirmed case that needs contact tracing. And even then, the contact tracer need to ask the QR code printer for the mapping between the 15 digits and the venue. So as to ensure this multi-party computation to protect the privacy of the out of purpose uses or uh, preventing each of those participating parties from compromising the privacy of citizen. So it's a privacy preserving contact tracing design that won more than 2 million of venues adoption on the very first week uh, and enable us to shorten the contact tracing from more than 24 hours to less than 24 minutes, which resulted in us in just a few short months uh, counter our first real wave of variants. Uh, and uh, later on, the Delta variants and so on never had a R value of above one and never got into the uh, you know, community spread. One of the questions that has been asked about the contact tracing system here in Australia mm -hmm. is whether it does have the potential to be misused. For example, whether the police could ask for that information mm -hmm. if they were investigating a crime. Is that mm -hmm. a discussion that's been had in Taiwan around yes, the system? Yes, definitely. And we actually did have a police person uh, who received via the wiretapping system some of the 15 digits of a uh, suspected uh, criminal. Uh, and uh, of course, our wiretap laws, uh, I think similar to the Australian ones, uh, are quite uh, restricted in the sense that it can only be applied uh, to more serious crimes uh, when investigating. And so, but because of the multi party design, and remember, <clears throat> we didn't design the system, it's a civil liberties group designing the system. So, from the day one, it's multi party. So, the police could not reverse engineer what those 15 digit means unless they, you know, visit and knock on the door of each and every venue, I guess. So, uh, they filed a search warrant to the QR code printer. Uh, asking them to hand over uh, the mapping table between the 15 digits and the actual venues. Uh, and then the judge denied the search warrant. Uh, and then the judge wrote a whistleblower right on the public newspaper uh, saying that uh, I, I wouldn't ever grant such a search warrant. And I want to make it very clear that each and every SMS printed on the SMS text, indeed on the QR code itself, that this is reserved for pandemic control use only. So if we use it out of purpose, we'll be breaking, breaching the social contract with the people. And because the SMS-based contact tracing is not voluntary, has never been voluntary. So that would mean that if people lose the trust, they will go back to <clears throat> pen and paper. And if they do, <clears throat> we're back to 24 hours or more of contact tracing, which would be really bad against the Delta variants. Um, and so this uh, logic is impeccable. So <clears throat> by the time that a judge uh, files the search, uh, sorry, denies the uh, search warrant, uh, we already have some internal discussions, but this public exposure made sure that GovZero uh, hold many discussions around this very topic. And our Center for Epidemic Control um, in the very next month um, issued an interpretation in conjunction with our Ministry of Justice saying that because those SMS were not sent to any particular person, right, it's to a um, kind of automated account and also is specified it deleted after 28 days, uh, unlike the wiretap, which only deletes after six months. So they are legally different things. So uh, if the telecom uh, operators do not hand over even the 15 digits, to the wiretappers, that's entirely legal. They should be classified as different things. So no matter how serious is the crime, the investigators must not uh, use the wiretapping data uh, coming from the 1922 SMS. And it should also be solved uh, technologically at the source of the wiretapping uh, apparatus. Um, and so I, I believe that's a very different decision made uh, uh, compared to our nearby Indo-Pacific jurisdictions, some of which said that the police should have free access. 
uh, some of which actually the police designed the contact tracing system in the first place, some of which said if the crime is serious enough, it warrants a search warrant and things like that. But Taiwan said no from, from day one. This is not a government technology. This is civil society technology. We didn't procure that. It's a reverse procurement. They procure it from the government, which provides the real time API and so on. So we need to adhere to the norm that's already set by the social sector. So I call it the people public private partnership where the people and the norm around which are designed in the social sector. It's really interesting to hear you talk about trust and the preservation of that social contract, because mm -hmm. one of the other pervading themes of the pandemic has been disinformation, of course, and that spreads mm -hmm. on PTT, the platform that you mm -hmm. mentioned as well. So um, mm -hmm. I want to put a question to you from one of my colleagues here at the Lowy Institute, Sasha Fegan. She asks, democracies around the world, from the United States to France, Ukraine and Taiwan, they've been dealing with state-sponsored disinformation campaigns, especially mm -hmm. during elections. Taiwan mm -hmm. set something of a gold standard, countering malign narratives during the election campaign. Can you talk a bit about what those disinformation campaigns were targeting and why during the election, but also tell us about the strategies using to counter those narratives, mm -hmm. both during the election and during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Certainly. Well, I, I talk about uh, humor over rumor uh, quite a bit, including a couple of TED Talks. Uh, so um, I would advise searching for humor over rumor and, and uh, see the entire playbook. Uh, but I will also want to um, highlight the other uh, strategy, which is notice and public notice. And the theory is this um, outrage spreads very quickly. And many of the leading conspiracy theories and disinformation, especially around election time, is not pro any particular candidate or pro any particular political party, but rather is against democracy itself. It's against the democratic process, the legitimacy of voting and things like that. So, for example, um, I would like to highlight, in addition to the humor over rumor strategy that uh, please search for more uh, in our playbook, I would also like to talk about notice and public notice, because a lot of conspiracy theories travel on outrage, especially before the election. They target against the democratic process, the legitimacy of the vote of the entire democratic system, rather than for any particular candidate or party. For example, in 2019, again, um, I think it was November, um, a couple months before our presidential election in January 2020, there was a viral disinformation that said, and I quote, the people in Hong Kong, the teenagers, uh, they're not fighting for democracy. They were being paid to um, 100,000 or 20 million um, dollars to uh, murder no. police on the street. They are rioters, mobsters, end of quotes. Now, um, and was a very scary looking um, kind of in a full gear uh, protester that looks rather young. Um, the, the photo was real, it was a Reuters photo, uh, but initially Reuters, the caption was just, there were teenage protesters in Hong Kong. Uh, so the alternate caption tries to deliver a different message, try to paint um, those who uh, fight for democracy as something else. Now, the information doesn't trend in Hong Kong. They can see through uh, the, the lie very quickly. But in uh, Taiwan, because the civil society, GovZero, again, provides a real-time dashboard of which variants of conspiracy theories are trending by asking people to voluntarily kind of flag email as spam, right? flood incoming instant messages as potential disinformation to realize real-time uh, clarification in a kind of a wiki uh, survey uh, of what's going on in the disinformation space. So we see the, the R value, the basic transmission rate of that particular uh, disinformation growing. Um, and so the Taiwan Fact Check Center uh, immediately sprung to action. It's an independent uh, journalistic uh, fact checker, part of the international fact checking network. And they discovered that this alternate caption came um, overtly, not covertly, overtly uh, from the Weibo account of the Chang An Sword, of the Zhongyang Zheng Fawe, of the Central Political and Law Unit in the Chinese Communist Party, right, uh, in their Weibo account. So they uh, immediately provide the public notice. And now because PTT uh, and 
Facebook and Yahoo and Google, YouTube and Line and so on have signed on the notice and public notice uh, self-regulation accord. So when you, for example, spread this message on Facebook, click and share, uh, you will see um, at that time very quickly uh, that this message is sponsored by the central political and law unit uh, as discovered by the town fact checking center. So in, in a sense, we're, we're not taking anything down, right? Just like we counter the pandemic with no lockdown, we counter the infodemic with no takedown. We just make sure that uh, we transform those same messages uh, kind of our mRNA strands uh, uh, into kind of the vaccination of the mind, right? So that when people see this kind of alternate shell, uh, like an mRNA vaccine, uh, they develop antibodies, they develop immunity in themselves, and then can participate in a much more competent manner on the internet, social media. Now, I am going to come back to humor over rumor in a moment, but because you mentioned <laughs> this campaign, from a part of the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party. I want to ask you a mm -hmm. question from Valerie Tan at Merricks, who mm -hmm. says, how sophisticated and effective are China's online influence campaigns in Taiwan? And do you see them as having an impact on the elections? Well, in 2018, uh, we've discovered, because that was also the year that our National Audit Office and the Control Yuan published uh, the entire campaign donation and expense, the finance records as open data. Previously, it was paper only, uh, but of zero again, kind of occupied the control yuan and brought out uh, the A4 paper printed copies and did a crowdsourced uh, OCR to make sure that we can reverse engineer uh, the previous campaign donation records. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we adopted the open data, structure open data starting 2018. Um, as a way for investigative journalists uh, to look at, uh, not just a control yuan, to look at the financing details. And we soon discovered that the social media advertisements, which at that point bypassed the fact-checking mechanisms, uh, especially on Facebook, but also on other um, internet uh, platforms, um, was not declared as campaign donation or finance. And also a lot of it, especially on Facebook, was funded uh, by jurisdictions outside of Taiwan, which would be illegal if it's a campaign donation because only domestic actors are permitted um, in a transparent way to donate uh, to political campaigns. So the same bunch of people who um, argued for radical transparency in the control yuan uh, talked to Facebook saying, um, you know, uh, Taiwan did not pass any law mandating you to do this. But we are ready to uh, start a social sanction on Facebook unless you adopt exactly the same norms that we have set uh, to the state. That is to say, radical transparency. As uh, soon as anyone starts a advertisement, it must be radically open in the advertisement library and also ban the foreign sponsored advertisement on social and political issues in the next election, which would be the presidential election. So comparing the 20 18 mayoral election slash national referendums uh, and the 2020 presidential election, we can see that the internet platforms adhered to the local social norms and the uh, extra jurisdictional um, disinformation campaigns and so on, uh, therefore did have a much lower impact during our presidential election. It's interesting, actually, because the last time I was in Taiwan was observing the 2020 mm -hmm. presidential election, the, the mm -hmm. last time I was overseas. And, you know, Taiwan is such a high technology kind of society. And then you have mm -hmm. a different kind of radical transparency in your elections mm -hmm. where it is pen mm -hmm. and paper and a chop and people holding up the votes as they're counted. Do you think mm -hmm. that that will continue? Like what, what accounts for that contrast between mm -hmm. elections and pen and paper and mm -hmm. then all of the technology that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in Taiwan, we count on paper with, as you said, uh, kind of announcing uh, each vote. Uh, and if you were at a counting booth, uh, you will see that the paper is shown to various different angles. Uh, and the reason why is that there's YouTubers among the observers. <laughs> there are people who are holding their smartphone or their camera recording the entire process. And the major parties have their own apps 
to do the telling. So it's not that they're not digital, it's that the digital was on the kind of auditing part of things. And the paper made it easier for the YouTubers of various different political parties uh, to, to live stream uh, the entire counting process. And that led uh, to a very quick counter disinformation campaign because um, if there is the kind of um, conspiracy theories, I remember there were one in the presidential election right during the counting process. There was a viral conspiracy theory that says there's invisible ink going on. Uh, whomever you vote to, the ink will disappear uh, and Dr. Tsai Ing-wen will receive another invisible ink and those ink were, and I quote, sponsored by the CIA, end of quote. So basically it's, it's a conspiracy theory, but it never really got viral because people can see, uh, no matter which party they support, their partisan YouTubers were actually at that uh, particular voting booth. And there are uh, video recordings to show that nothing like that uh, has taken place and so on. So uh, I guess unless uh, we find another more accountable way of uh, counting, that could enable this sort of participatory audit. People would not want to give up this very legitimate way of participatory audit, especially um, on the votes to people with potential kind of exponential capture, right? If you uh, vote for a president, the president can then work on changing the voting system. The same goes for the legislature and the same for the city council and the mayors, right? Uh, so we do have electronic voting and internet voting, but not for people. We do have them, as I mentioned, for e-petitions, for the e-collecting, uh, for uh, participatory budgeting, for uh, ranking the priority of the sustainable goal projects in presidential hackathon. But because the theory was that there were no uh, legitimacy based on paper in those particular uh, newly invented democratic institutions, and also there's no exponential capture because it's just voting for one piece of budget instead of a single person. You mentioned before Taiwan using humor, not rumor, to combat disinformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean to be impolite, but governments are not traditionally very good at humor. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you could comment on how that's been working, but also whether you think this approach can be exported to other countries. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, yes. Uh, I think uh, many of our government ministers now realize that humor is pretty much the only positive emotion that spreads faster than outrage. So really, if we want our signs, our clarifications uh, to kind of outrun um, the conspiracy theories based on outrage, we have to engage people in a spirit of humor over rumor. And that's just a fact. Now, um, it, it doesn't really mean that each minister need to be a comedian, uh, although I did kind of shake bubble tea on the uh, top of my Twitter. If you search for my Twitter account, I, I pinned a post of me shaking the bubble tea, explaining digital democracy. So that's, I guess, quite humorous. But we're, we're not asking our fellow ministers to do that. We're asking them to engage with their team of participation officers, a dedicated team of career public service within each ministry in charge of coming up with engagement strategies. And it's both ways, it's uh, symmetrical. It's not just about uh, pushing uh, via the very cute spokes dog, a Shiba Inu named Stone Chai, a cute dog saying, um, don't put your uh, foot in your mouth, uh, sorry, your hand in your mouth, wear a mask uh, to protect you against your own unwashed hand, uh, which went absolutely viral. And which is partly why uh, no conspiracy theory around mask use uh, is popular in Taiwan, uh, because the cute dog is just too cute. Uh, but it's also about engaging the YouTubers and comedians in the civil society by providing them <clears throat> with the real time data by uh, offering to use creative commons uh, to enable free remix of not just Song Chai, but our uh, reports of the real time counter epidemic uh, statistics and so on. It enabled the creators uh, in the citizenry to also come up with their own humorous way to even start a very popular campaign called Taiwan can help uh, that us uh, that uh, posts uh, in the I think New York Times advertisement on paper 
America, but also working with YouTubers around the world uh, to share the uh, very popular uh, massive online open course uh, taught by our then Vice President Chen Tianren, also the textbook author on epidemiology on the Taiwan model. And the YouTubers in other jurisdictions are very happy also to share the message uh, using their own language and cultures and so on. So I would argue that as long as we contribute to the digital commons and, as I mentioned, treat it as an infrastructure with the same personnel and budgetary commitments, uh, the government can uh, learn social technology as they can learn from the industrial technologies. Well, I do remember the cat memes all over Taipei when I was there last time, so that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yes. We, we had Taiwan mm -hmm. Can Help Written in the Sky by a sky radar across Sydney actually yeah, yeah, last yes, year, so yes. it's uh -huh. definitely gone global. Uh, one more question about COVID. So even mm -hmm. though Taiwan is one of the only countries that has zero COVID and has also mm -hmm. successfully combated a Delta variant, mm -hmm. it's been slower mm -hmm. than some others in the region to vaccinate. So I wanted to mm -hmm. ask about how you explain Taiwan's success in managing infections, but then slower rates of vaccinations. I think the vaccine coverage as of this week in Australia is 78 right, percent of the population and Taiwan is 77 point six. So we're not that slow, you know, <laughs> we're on very similar level of vaccination uh, as of this week. Uh, but it's true that we started later than Australia. It's just we were faster. Uh, and so uh, the reason why we started later uh, was because of vaccine hesitancy. And that was because we've had a, a run of 10 months of essentially no COVID at all. So when I vaccinated uh, on AstraZeneca uh, in, I think, mid-April, uh, no, nobody want to get vaccinated. Uh, there's plenty of vaccines and not enough people willing. Uh, even when our premier and uh, uh, Minister Chen Shizhong of CECC <coughs> all demonstrated by vaccinating themselves, I had a very difficult time convincing even my um, executive secretary and my family to get vaccinated uh, by, by vaccinating my, myself. Of course, uh, that changed uh, when we faced our first and real only wave uh, in May, but it takes time to procure those vaccines. And in the earlier rounds of negotiations, we um, basically could not make a case that if you send millions of doses to Taiwan, you will um, actually, there will be people willing to receive those doses. Uh, so we had to scramble and arrange the delivery, uh, which um, only started around July. So it took a couple of months uh, to secure the vaccine supply. Uh, but once we started securing the vaccine supply and roll out the nationwide vaccination appointment system in July, uh, the um, uh, vaccination rate is very, very quick. Uh, so I think by now we're, we're on par uh, with most uh, jurisdictions uh, in Indo-Pacific. And personally, uh, end of this month, I'm going to receive the booster dose as well. Yes, to be clear, Australia was also, I think, slower, perhaps for very similar mm -hmm. reasons, but are mm -hmm. catching up now or doing quite well in particular mm -hmm. parts mm -hmm. now. I want to mm -hmm. ask about Taiwan Can Help and whether you think that promoting democracy should be a key part of Taiwan's foreign policy as it goes out in the world? That's a great question. Uh, indeed, previously, uh, Taiwan can help meant um, the healthcare system, which will help many jurisdictions uh, to set up. Uh, it meant um, broadband access. It meant agricultural uh, technology uh, to um, improve the, the soil and uh, uh, local um, supply of foods and so on. But that's what Taiwan was known for. Uh, but open government, I believe, uh, started to be one of our kind of exports of the Taiwan model um, because of the pandemic, but it's not just because of the pandemic. I remember a couple of years before the pandemic, already our counter disinformation playbook uh, is already um, being adopted and adapted in other jurisdictions. Even the non-democratic or not so democratic ones see the value of in the consumer protection or in clarifying conspiracy theories around medical information and things like that. People trust their local experts 
experts, not necessarily the government on these matters. So the things like humor over rumor, pop, uh, notice and public notice, and things like that were already valuable playbooks uh, in those um, kind of slightly less democratic regimes uh, and embraced by their civil society and NGOs. And indeed, Taiwan was at the same place when I was born. Taiwan was still under the martial law. Uh, and during the decades of the 70s, 80s, and finally the direct presidential election in 96, those two decades and more, we see the social sector focusing initially not on politics or campaigning for democracy itself, but just uh, with the government to be more open when it comes to the charitable issues of providing education, of health, of disaster recovery, of credit union movements, consumer co-op movement, and things like that. So we're seeing that these movements, which are based on open government principles, but not directly saying we need to uh, democratically elect for president tomorrow uh, in, in a kind of softer way of Taiwan can help because we can share the entire experience transitioning completely non-violently uh, from our authoritarian regime all the way to one of the world's leading liberal democracies. Well, on this, I might ask you a question from our audience. Uh, Matthew Nguyen mm -hmm. from the Tony Blair Institute, he asks, how do we combat the rise of fake news laws in the region? In, in Taiwan in 2016, when we um, tackled this question, the first decision we did was not call it fake news. Um, in, in, in Mandarin, um, news, xinwen, and journalism, xinwenye, or xinwen gongzuo, uh, literally has the, the same root. Uh, journalism is literally news work. Uh, and so there's really no way to say fake news without offending journalists. Unless it's a journalist saying that, which would be okay. Uh, but otherwise, uh, people would naturally think of Jia Xinwen or fake news uh, as a journalist not holding themselves up to the journalistic standards. But as we know, uh, most of the so-called fake news are actually uh, information manipulations. So the manipulators were not journalists to begin with. Right, which is why we call the misinformation or malinformation or disinformation the infodemic, uh, which concentrates on a public mental health, like public health, public mental health aspect of these things. Instead of targeting journalists, we see the journalists, the fact checkers, as a valuable, indeed a vital skill, uh, just like public health is the most important. Um, field of study when countering the pandemic, journalism, public mental health uh, is the most important thing when countering the infodemic. And we need to popularize professional journalism beyond the elites in the media, but rather also, uh, as I mentioned, the middle schoolers, the primary schoolers who measure air quality and contribute to the weather reports of PM 2.5 and air pollution to co-determine whether their parents will go out to jog on any morning and so on. So they are also the, the weather station, right? So by democratizing the media, by making sure the young people, as well as people who are very senior, learn about journalism. I believe these are the true vaccines of the mind uh, to counter against the infodemic. Now, we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you briefly mm -hmm. about Australia. Australia and Taiwan mm -hmm. have more in common than most people would realize. Mm -hmm. We're island nations of around 25 million mm -hmm. people with rich indigenous history, grappling with multiculturalism. More recently, we have more shared experiences in terms of how we've combated COVID-19 and of course, being on the receiving end of economic coercion from China. Do, do you see more that our countries can do together? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's a global cooperation and training framework, uh, the GCTF. There was initially a, a US-Taiwan uh, bilateral thing, but it's now grown uh, to have the co-hosts of uh, also Australia and Japan. So I think based on this, I think many people will call it a, a mini-lateral, right, or, or a plurilateral um, idea of international engagement. We are working with 
the like-minded countries, uh, more than, uh, I think it's around 40 different countries now who have participated in the GCTF framework. And we also look forward, of course, uh, to work on uh, the Summit for Democracy, the Open Government Partnership, and many other uh, international arrangements of democracies. I believe that's also one of the very valuable coalitions of alliance that we need to work together. So my last question for you, Audrey, there's a lot of talk about Taiwan's future and the scenarios range from the optimistic to frankly quite dire. And various countries mm -hmm. talk about how to react to these scenarios. You know, here in Australia, this has received a lot of attention as we're heading into an election. Mm -hmm. What I wanna ask you is what kind of conversation do you think the world should be having about Taiwan and its future? That's a great question. Um, Personally, uh, I think the hashtag Taiwan can help, Taiwan is helping, um, says a lot. It's not just about the democratic institutions or the bubble tea uh, or the agricultural or broadband or many other things that we have to, to offer, but we also sincerely um, want to offer on any of the sustainable development goals, all the 17 goals, you can find uh, the Taiwanese people working on not necessarily made in Taiwan products uh, or services, but rather the models of the cross-sectoral collaboration to help us to tackle the most important problem that confronts the global people, including climate change and emergency and the kind of biological and virus of the mind that we have talked about. Because fundamentally, uh, these issues are global and can only be tackled if people of various different jurisdictions, uh, cultural backgrounds, and so on, form shared goals. So I, I want uh, to say that Taiwan can help. It's not just about specific technologies that can help to amplify existing goals, but rather all the kinds of people-public private partnership we've been talking about are the social technologies for goal formation, for making sure that people of variously different positions can come to shared values in a almost predictable fashion in Taiwan, like every 24 hours after each CCC press conference or every seven days after the crowdsourced um, counter pandemic systems iteration, every 60 days after citizens initiatives, every year after presidential hackathon and so on, we're working on such technologies that can help to tackle whatever issues this result of the lack of mutual trust um, bring, brings about. So that's the main thing Taiwan has to offer. And to me, what Taiwan can help signifies. Audrey, thank you so much for joining me today. We are so grateful for your time and wish you the best of luck this week at the Summit for Democracy. Thank you, live long and prosper. <laughs> Thank you again to Audrey and thank you to my colleagues, mm -hmm. Andrea Pollard, Josh Goding and Shane McLeod for event support. And thank you to you, our audience, for joining me in another long distance Lowy Institute event.